I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. People still say that we cannot fail. We cannot lose this war. We will win, whatever it costs. I think this uh, moral corruption of Russian people is the gravest crime made by Putin. Boris Bondarev is the only Russian diplomat who has publicly resigned since the start of the war in Ukraine. For the latest issue of Foreign Affairs, Bondarev wrote an extraordinary essay, in part about why he quit. But more than that, the essay reveals the depth of Putin's delusion and why Russia's war effort has been such a disaster. My colleague Kate Brannon sat down with Bondarev to talk about the essay and his 20 years working for the Russian Foreign Ministry. Boris Bondarev, it's a thrill to have you join us today on the Foreign Affairs Interview. Thank you for inviting me. I want to talk about your piece that you wrote in our latest issue called The Sources of Russian Misconduct, A Diplomat Defects from the Kremlin. It's a fascinating read, and it takes us through your career as a Russian diplomat and also the moment last May when you decided to resign publicly. Yeah. Yeah. But before we get to all that, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like when you joined in 2002? You were in your early 20s, and you write in the piece about some of your disappointment when you first started, that it maybe wasn't as glamorous as you expected. What was the reality like when you began as a diplomat in 2002? Well, in 2002, to be a Russian diplomat then didn't mean that you could have some privileges. It was in Soviet times when diplomats were really privileged class of people. In the beginning of 2000, everybody could travel abroad. So diplomacy was not something extraordinary. Of course, people still believe that you are closer to some you know, state secrets and some kind. And it was still intriguing. And it is still, for many of my uh, friends who are not uh, connected with MFA, they still believe that diplomacy and diplomatic job is something, you know, is full of uh, intrigues, full of some, you know, secrets and mysteries. And so it's very, they believe it is very interesting. It's very, very fascinating job. And I hate every time to disappoint them when I, <laughs> when I try to tell them it is far from being real. Over the 20 years of your diplomatic career, did you mostly live abroad versus inside Russia? And sort of how did that shape your perspective on being Russian and foreign views of Russia and... How did it shape your thinking? For my 20 years, I think I lived abroad about 10 years, so it's half and half. I always try to see how other diplomats, I mean, foreign diplomats are working, how they present themselves, how they make their remarks, how they behave and so on. It was interesting to compare it with what was adopted in our practice. And of course, I very, 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 very often I noticed that there is, there was a lot that we could take on board for our own sake. For instance, when I worked in the Department for Non-Proliferation, and we, we had a lot of meetings, for instance, with U.S. diplomats, and there were a lot of technical issues, and I just noticed that it was very often, and I think it was a practice for American diplomats that. They have a very big delegations like ours, but on every particular question in the discussion, they had a particular expert, a delegate. So when we start question A, they had this a guy who was on this question A, I don't know, for 20 years, and he had the mic and his talk talk there. When we started to discuss question B, they had another guy with a sick folder who was uh, definitely a specialist in this question alone. We, we didn't have this practice. We had to be like... Experts you know, on everything? Experts on everything, but you cannot be experts on everything. You can have some knowledge on the surface, but you mm -hmm. cannot be profound experts on all issues. I wanted to switch gears to ask you about one of the parts of your piece that I found most interesting. For all of us on the outside, you know, the performance, the dismal performance of the Russian military in Ukraine has sort of shocked the world and few people saw it coming. But in your piece, you talk about that from your vantage point in the foreign ministry, you had clues earlier on that the Russian military might not be as strong as it purported to be. And I'm just going to read a quote from your piece. 
For those of us who worked on military issues, it was plain that the Russian armed forces were not as mighty as the West feared, in part thanks to economic restrictions the West implemented after Russia's 2014 seizure of Crimea that were more effective than policymakers seemed to realize. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, about what you observed and when you observed it, and what your thoughts were about the strength of the military leading up to February of this year? When I worked on this area, I discovered for myself that a lot of very crucial things, crucial components for weapons, for military equipment and so on, were imported from the United States, from Europe, from other countries. And it was a, a very, a very, very, very wide spectrum of this, starting from the machine tools, like high precision machine tools, which are essential for any modern industry now. And sometimes they had to just to smuggle them, a few of them, through the borders, just to get it to some military factories in Russia, or some even some kind of fabrics. For instance, we don't have enough production of any kind of fabrics in Russia, fabrics to make uh, uniforms or even some special specific fabrics for aircraft or uh, some other equipment. And of course, these electronics, mm -hmm. which is essential for missiles, for aviation, for uh, space equipment. Most of them was imported from the United States, from Japan, from Taiwan, from Singapore, from other countries. And I was puzzled with this very military warmongering rhetoric saying that we have our armed force is second in the world, our military potential is very high. And I just asked uh, myself and some colleagues that how are we going to fight with the West if they have all the keys from our military power and might? So it's strange. I think first we must be able to produce all these things at home to be independent. I'm not sure whether the Russian government really realized the impact of those sanctions, or they perhaps they were also misguided by people who dealt with these sanctions, of course, because they, I think, reported also that it's not that bad as it seemed. So they just like to sweeten this the case. And uh, I think maybe Moscow really thought that, okay, we can cope with that. So yes, maybe, but we will find the other ways to get what we need. Some like smuggling, you know, like buying it through some uh, third countries or some, uh, you know, front companies. And, and there are a lot of ways to circumvent sanctions. But, you know, you cannot buy the same quantity of the goods with these uh, circumvential uh, ways. Of course, it will be less in quantity in numbers and will be much more expensive in price. And since we, we got the recent news that in some Russian missiles in Ukraine, they found some uh, microchips from uh, like uh, washing machines or something, that just demonstrates yeah, that they have to go, you know, to take some extraordinary measures to somehow replenish those reserves of electronics and some other high technologies mm -hmm. that Russia is not capable of uh, substituting. And so this impact on the military industrial base in Russia, you just talked about these washing machine chips, but are there other ways you're seeing that impact play out on the battlefield? Or do you expect to see it further hurt the military down the line as this war drags on? Well, we see already that, for instance, Russian um, strategic missile troops like cruise missiles, like caliber cruise missiles, which is said to be one of the most technological Russian weapons for today, which cruise missiles which are fired from the ships, they are not accurate as they were said to be. Mm -hmm. And there is no Russian missiles who can be compared with the accuracy with uh, US missiles or European made, you know. That's because they lack this electronics component and the other technologies of high precision. And even this GLONASS navigation system, which is not fully working even now, because the satellites have a very short lifespan and they are very easily malfunction. And this all orbital group is not okay because they have always have some problems and difficulties. For instance, I also read that the 
average lifespan of Russian satellites is two, three, or even four times shorter than that of US satellites because their technologies are inferior. And those uh, components for space satellites, they were also almost all was imported from the West. And when the sanctions were imposed on these dual use items, of course, it uh, made a very hard blow to abilities of Russian industry to produce uh, highly technological equipment. Mm -hmm. Over the course of your career at the ministry, I know people are asking now, what made you stay during that time? Why didn't you resign sooner? Were there other times that you considered leaving or were there other moments that were red flags for you, but you were able to move past them? Talk to us a little bit about your own conversation with yourself as you continue to represent Russia in the world. Yeah, it was a very, very long conversation with myself. So my job was quite interesting and it was more or less well paid. And, you know, when you are in civil service, it is well, practically impossible to get fired. Just if you make something, you know, extraordinary, something outrageous, that if you work more or less, you know, average, well, it's okay. And uh, it's one thing. On the other hand, I thought even during this Medvedev term as president, and when Putin uh, announced that he would come back as president in 2012, and there was uh, some um, mass protest in Moscow. I also thought that my sister and her husband, they went there to these protests in Moscow. And I thought that I would be joining them if I were in Moscow at that time. Because I thought that Putin did lead Russia into the wrong direction. And I thought that it would not end well. And I thought that maybe I should quit and maybe I should find some other job. But on the other hand, you see that nothing changes very swiftly because, okay, Putin came back, but but you don't see anything that could be really, really frightening to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, he cracked down on opposition. Okay, yes, they persecuted a few hundreds of people and you believe it's it's not fair, it's bad. But okay, then you think that to quit, you must look for a job. You know, you must come out of this zone of comfort and it's not very easy and then when the situation got more and more severe in the last seven, eight years, the idea of looking for a job somewhere beyond the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was, uh, you know, becoming more and more uh, gloomy because you you know that to get the comparable level of income, for instance, you must get a job somewhere in a state-controlled area, like state-controlled mm-hmm. business or state corporation. But if you get out from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, your prospects for getting a good job would be rather low. Mm-hmm. And that's another consideration that would stop. And every time you tell yourself that, okay, maybe not this time, but okay, I will quit definitely, maybe two years, three years more, then I find something. Was this the conversation that you were having sort of internally with yourself or with your wife? Or was it something that you were talking about more broadly with your colleagues? I talked with my colleagues and we all agreed that we are not very uh, much uh, you know, satisfied about what is going on and how we handle this. So we thought that our ministry could have worked differently. There were a lot of things to change in you know, our internal procedures of how the information is processed and just diplomatic, even diplomatic uh, methods, how we should communicate with others, how we should, a lot of things could be changed to enhance the effectiveness and make it better. But Then the main question would rise, why, what for should we all do this? Because if we want to make a more responsible, more reliable uh, policy, first of all, we must answer that what are our fundamental goals of our Russian policy in the world? And then all ways of thinking, they just come to one place, to one place called uh, Mr. Putin, because everything goes to this one spot, the president who decides for all. And with every year, I realized it more and more clearly that Mr. Putin is mostly concerned about his personal power rather than good image of Russia or with maintaining good and uh, progressive and you know, beneficial relations with other countries and so on and so on. And then it was, uh, of course, evident that nobody is really interested in reforming our foreign service. 
Because to reform it, you must reform all the civil service, all system of governance. And this governing system in Russia, which is built on loyalty and uh, corruption, cannot be just reformed. You cannot reform just one part of this without uh, changing others. You just fail. And when you think about it, you understand that there can nothing, nothing can be done with this. You can try to mitigate of your own place. You can do something to enhance your own efficiency and your job, but it will be annihilated by your colleagues and other guys who do not do this, who just do what they're told. So tell us on February 24th, the day that the invasion began, you've talked to us right up till this point that your decision didn't come out of the blue. It sounds like you had a real baseline of frustration and even anger, maybe. Could you tell us sort of where your thinking was at before you read the news of what was happening in Ukraine? I didn't think that he would start the war because I thought it was obvious. It was obvious to me, and I thought it was obvious to everybody, including Putin, that Ukraine is not that weak as it was in 2014. The Russian army is not as that strong as it is reported to be. And that the West would not refrain from anything, would not just swallow this you know, war and uh, we'll be back to normal as soon as possible. So I think those three things were very evident to me, and I thought that Putin, having them in mind, would not start the war, because what could he get? It sounds like you had better information in many respects than Putin did himself. Could you tell us how it is that you had your observations? You knew that Ukraine was stronger than it appeared to be and that the Russian military was weaker than it appeared to be. How did you know that and he didn't? I understand that all the reports that he got, they were much more pleasant to, to see, to hear. They were much more encouraging, I think. And I think they were disguising some uh, truth with a lot of things that our military potential is very high. Our abilities as a great power is very high. We have nuclear weapons, of course. It's the sign of our national pride, you know. So nobody will mess with us and we will have what we want. And of course, they, he was uh, misinformed by his own fellow people from special services who informed him on Ukraine. And they obviously misused all the money that had been uh, provided for them. They misused them and they reported back that it is okay that Ukraine is looking forward to get reunited with Russia. So Putin, of course, Putin built a system which is isolated him mm -hmm. from the reality. So he's the one to be blamed for this. Yes, you write in the piece that I'm going to quote you here. But for me, one of the invasion's central lessons had to do with something I'd witnessed over the preceding two decades. What happens when a government is slowly warped by its own propaganda? So that's what you're talking about right now and how Putin, in the end, didn't perhaps have the best information at his hands. Yes, yes, I think. Because I, I believe that all information which is reported to him, it is edited in many ways. Retext is redrafted in order to, not to make him angry. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, if you report some unpleasant truth, the first reaction of your boss would be that, how did you allow this to happen? Why didn't you change this? Why didn't you work uh, hard enough to make this truth uh, you know, more pleasant? Because, and you, you cannot uh, just say that it's not my fault, that the instructions that I got was unrealistic and they could not be implemented in principle, because... Nobody would care about your arguments because was your boss, he, he's never wrong. You know, if he says to you that you must go to the White House and says to President Biden that it wasn't Russia who attacked Ukraine, that Ukraine attacked Ukraine with Russian troops, maybe, then uh, you must do it and President Biden must be fully convinced of this. If he's not, mm -hmm. that it means that you don't work hard enough and you should be replaced. That's it, in simple words. We'll be back after a short break. From Oxford University Press comes a new book, Overreach, How China Derailed Its Peaceful Rise by Susan L. Shirk. For decades, China's rise to power was characterized by its reassurance that this rise would be peaceful, until something changed. China went from fragile superpower to global heavyweight, threatening Taiwan and its neighbors and tightening its grip on Hong Kong. It's openly challenged the United States for preeminence, not just economically and technologically, but also militarily. 
In Overreach, Susan L. Shirk pries open the black box of China's political system and looks at what derailed its peaceful rise. Now available wherever books are sold. So on February 24th, talk to us about your decision. You didn't actually publicly resign until May, but you made the decision that morning, as you write in your piece. Tell us about making that decision and then what steps do you immediately have to start taking to implement it? Well, first, yes, we agreed that I, I should quit because... We meaning you and your wife, correct? Yes, yes. Me, me and my wife, yes. Because, of course, to stay would mean that I fully endorse all these things. Mm -hmm. It was like my inner, inner decision, but it was a decision of the heart, so to speak. But you will have also to gather some, you know, courage to make it, even not, not to make public, but even just to write your letter of resignation, yes, and to hand it over. And so, okay, I, I start thinking that what I will be doing next, for instance, okay, I can resign and then go back to Moscow, and then I will be in very bad position because I my prospects to get another job were, well, not very likely, you know, something like that. And uh, my wife also, she quit just a month before. So, of course, she, she also had very, very low income. So, and I think that it would be very, very problematic. So, I started thinking about this. Then I started thinking that maybe I should make some public statement also when I resign, just to show people that I'm not with them. I don't like it. I think that it is wrong and it is a crime and so on. And, um, and then when I like, figured out this, I also we decided first to get all my family with me here in Geneva mm -hmm. because I thought that if I do it in Moscow, I could be uh, persecuted because we already had some uh, new legislation mm -hmm. about the uh, suppressing people who were against the war, against the special military operation. So my wife went back to Moscow for the cat to get it back. You know, it took some time. Just to stop so our listeners understand, your wife returned to Moscow to get your cat, yes. who was there to bring the cat to Geneva to join you, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and since there was no uh, direct air connection between uh, Geneva and Moscow anymore, mm -hmm. and my wife, she uh, wanted to get uh, from Geneva to Moscow, we bought the last tickets on the last Aeroflot flight from Geneva to Moscow. So it was very difficult for her to get back to Moscow. Then in Moscow, of course, she had a lot of things with the cat and some other things also. And it took about well, more than two months to get him all proper documents. And then mm -hmm. it was another adventure to get him back to Geneva. Mm -hmm. He's still a little bit <laughs> too much excited about it. I have to say, as a fellow cat owner, I'm deeply impressed with your commitment to getting your cat to safety. What's your cat's name? His name is Simeon. Okay. It's close um, to Simon. Simeon. Yes, yes. So once you decided to resign publicly, once sort of you had everything in order and you were back outside of Russia in safety, and then is that the moment you submitted your resignation? Yes, yes. Did you expect the media attention? Were you prepared for that? Well, I expected some attention, of course, because I think it would be some kind of a story for a couple of days. And also I thought I had a, I had a hope, though it was quite a little hope, but I had a hope that maybe some my uh, fellow colleagues from other Russian embassies who may think like me- Would follow. Yes, that, for instance, they yeah, might follow me. How did you feel when that didn't happen? Well, I, I was not really disappointed because I expected that Sooner, no one would follow. And if there were one or two who would follow me, I would be very happy about that. Unfortunately, uh, though some guys wrote to me saying, praising my steps, saying that unfortunately, due to some reason, they could not follow me. Has your decision to resign, did it cost you? I mean, it obviously cost you personally. You had to pack up and leave Moscow and you don't know when you can go back. But did it cost you in terms of relationships? Are there people who disagree with you or family? What has that been like in terms of your personal relationships? My sister, she said that she supports me 
And my father said that I made a mistake because I didn't see the bigger picture. And what's the bigger picture? I, th- I think the bigger picture that Putin sees, and my father, I think the two in Russia who see the bigger picture, and I don't. Sorry, I didn't agree with him, but then we didn't communicate with him. Unless I heard a few days ago when, this, when the mobilization was announced in, in Russia, on the first day of mobilization, my 75-year-old father rushed into this uh, mobilization center to get drafted. Oh, really? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surprising because since 2000, he was a very strong opponent of Putin. He said that we should never vote for him, that he would be dictator and blah, 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 blah. And now this, this man is totally, totally changed. Now, I, I think he, he just fell victim to this propaganda. Did that change happen before February? I mean, is that sort of a change that was long in the making, sort of consuming that propaganda and changing his worldview, or is it more recent? I think, yes, I think, yes. It's propaganda works every day, you know, and if you allow it to spill into your skull, into your head, um, and of course it may, you know, convert you into someone whom you have never been before. So, for instance, I, I know a lot of people who were quite reasonable, mm-hmm. and I thought they were reasonable, but then turned out to be absolutely, you know, chauvinistic and uh, these, I would say, fascist people, which they don't think they are fascists. They don't call themselves. They just think that it's okay that Russia is strong, Russia is great. That's why Russia is entitled to do whatever they want. You know, this presumption of Russia being always right, and since we are always right, we cannot fail. We cannot lose. Mm-hmm. That's how they consider this war. Even despite the news that Russian troops have already retreated from many, many, many positions and uh, suffered a lot of losses, people still say that we cannot fail. We cannot lose this war. We will win, whatever it costs. I think this uh, moral corruption of Russian people is the gravest crime made by Putin. Mm-hmm. Because I even I can't imagine how these people, these millions of people can be cured from this illness, you know. I don't know. I have no idea. It would be, it is a very dangerous uh, thing it, and it will have a very dangerous consequences in the years to come, even after Putin is gone. It's so fascinating to me, especially as an American, where disinformation and propaganda have also, you know, it's a huge problem here and family members talk about losing loved ones to propaganda as well. And this idea that it's so difficult to unwind that and what that means, I mean, especially in Russia, as you just talked about, like even if Putin is unseated, you have this cohort of people that I don't know if I want to say brainwashed, but that's what you're describing and what happens after that. How do people get unwound from almost a cult of personality in that sense? Well, it's it's hard to predict, but there are some considerations which could make us more optimistic. First of all, we have a historical precedence for this dismantling of cult personality. Mm -hmm. For instance, like it was with Stalin in 1956, when his uh, crimes and his uh, terror and all these things were like declared from the in the Kremlin itself that Comrade Stalin was not always right, and he was uh, somehow uh, guilty in mass murders and all, and it was shock for people who were for 30 years and even even more, who were brainwashed and who believed Stalin, saw him as a a living God or something, their father and so on, but okay, they got over this. So, but of course it was in in the time when the Soviet rule was still strong. When Putin is gone, of course, it would be a very huge civil unrest. Mm -hmm. It will be a very unstable situation. But also I would say that all those brainwashed people all those pro-war activists, they are naturally much, much less active. They are much less capable of acting independently, if I put it so. Putin, for many years, for 20 years, he has been destroying any ability of people to organize and to do independent, who could uh, defend, could protect their rights or views or whatever. And this works both ways. It works both into the opposition, which also has a lot of difficulties to organize itself, 
And it also is very characteristic about his own supporters. They also, they believe the propaganda, but once propaganda stops and once Putin is not in place, they will be demoralized. It doesn't mean that they will just flow into streets with, you know, with guns and whatever, and will say, okay, we want another Putin, maybe, maybe even more cruel Putin, we want to nuke America and you no. Know, no, they, they can do this, but they can even shout it, but mostly in their own flats. And the situation may be decided by those active people, active minority who would really come to the streets. So there can be some really active uh, pro-war activists, but they will be minority, they are already minority, very mm -hmm. loud. And they will not have any support from government structures because government will be in collapse, more or less. And that position for, for democracy forces can have a chance also to come and to present themselves to the people. But, you know, it looks like a kind of a, a kind of a civil war, maybe. Maybe it can be limited to some, you know, clashes in the cities, but who knows? It is very, very challenging. Boris, I also wanted to ask you about what you think of the West's approach to Putin so far. What's it getting wrong? Or what is it not understanding? Well, I think, first of all, it is that this war is a personal project of Putin. It's not something that's shared by all Russia. It's more a product of propaganda. But of course, the Russians still show a very high degree of submissiveness and obedience. It's partly traditional, partly it's propaganda. But I think this propaganda can be uh, kind of vaporized very soon. You know, they will lose all this moral compass, I would say so. Because for 20 years, they believed in what Putin has said. And then it will turn out that he was wrong in, in everything. You know? And uh, to take it would mean that you will have to say that it is a part of your fault also, that you personally allowed this man to brainwash you, to turn you into just his puppet. You know? I don't think that a lot of people could be uh, you know, strong enough to, to do that, to accept this truth. And so there will be a lot of people who would blame anybody who would succeed to Putin in all these failures, in this defeat, and in all people who died during the war, all these deaths will be not on Putin, but on those who will come after him, who will stop the war, who will start negotiations about peaceful settlement and so on. It was like in the 90s when President Yeltsin was blamed for everything bad that happened after Soviet Union collapse, and those people could not understand that it was due to Soviet Union because it was Soviet Union economy that collapsed, uh, whether President Yeltsin wanted it or not. So I think it will be the same this time. Well, Boris, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your story with foreign affairs and with our listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much for all these uh, things to, to be possible. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Marcus Zacharia. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, and Gabrielle Sierra. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks for listening.